Please welcome Snowflake Senior Vice President of Product, Christian Kleinerman. Good morning. How are you all doing? Enjoying the conference? We have a whole day of extra cool sessions, things to learn, new people to meet. So uh, let's make the most out of uh, what's been a great Snowflake Summit. For today, we have an amazing, amazing panel. Uh, three very, very uh, distinguished individuals in the area of AI and ML. We try to channel what may be the questions in your mind on how do I make sense out of generative AI, LLMs, what does it mean, what do I need to know, what am I missing? So I want to introduce three amazing panelists. First one may not need introduction, Andrew Ung, CEO and founder of Landing AI. Probably, okay, well, welcome. He, he, he was telling me backstage, roughly out of the people that have taken training on AI, one in a thousand people has watched his content, his videos, so he's trained several million people, eight million people or so. Welcome. Thank you. Hey, everyone. No, number two panelist, Ali Dalul. He's a Microsoft VP responsible for the entire Azure platform, which includes Azure OpenAI. Welcome, Ali. Hey. <laughs> Thank you very much. And Jonathan Cohen, he's the VP of Applied ML and Applied Research at NVIDIA. Jonathan, welcome. Okay, amazing set of panelists. Again, we have a, a handful of questions that we think may be in your mind, but what we agreed at backstage is we're just gonna go with the flow, we're gonna see where the conversation goes. So, shall we get started? Absolutely. And maybe the, the first question that is in the, the minds of many people is, is this Gen AI thing real or is it another type of tech trend that everyone gets excited and six months from now we will have moved on to the next one, but how real is it? Do, do, do you see there's some hype for sure, but what's behind the hype? Who wants to start? Andrew, go. Oh, sure, so you know, it feels like a bunch of people have been talking about AI for like a decade now. And I think what happened is um, starting about 10, 15 years ago, supervised learning, deep learning started to work really well. So we could, got good at labeling things, such as given an ad, label of someone will click on this to show more relevant ads, or you know, given an image, label of medical diagnosis. Um, so that started to happen 10, 15 years ago. And what has happened in the last couple of years is the rise of generative AI as an alternative tool box, uh, an alternative tool in our toolbox that let us generate text and images. One tricky thing to think about AI is that it's a general purpose technology, uh, like electricity, it's not useful just for one thing. And whereas in the last decade, a lot of teams was doing a lot of work to figure out what are the concrete use cases to which to apply supervised learning, we're not even done with that but with generative AI as another major tool in our toolbox, we now have you know, even a larger set of things that's suddenly possible and even more work ahead of us to figure out the concrete use cases. Ali, what's your yeah. take? Yeah, and no, I would add, I would say there are two parts to the question, Christian, and I think building on what Andrew said, I think first, if you look back to where we've come from, you know, what we call traditional AI or narrow AI or weak AI, it's really a single purpose, single modality, single task, and that's you know, that's done really, really well, but it's been really expensive. You know, the CapEx, the investment you have to make, you know, the, the fact that you gotta prepare the data, apply an algorithm, build a model, fine tune a model. And you've, got, you've seen that in a lot of the consumer services, whether it's, you know, in speech or, you know, computer vision or anything like that, but it has not crossed the mainstream. What makes this real, and why I would say, again, hype aside, there are three things that make it real. The first is these, the generative AI with the large language models is you know, self-supervised learning. It uses web scale data. The economics of that data has gone down to almost zero, very high quality data. Uh, our friends at NVIDIA have created amazing compute that you know, really uh, exceeds even human calculations per second, human brain calculations per second. And you've got the architectures and the science have caught up to the hypothesis where you now have really multi-modality 
uh, multi-purpose rich models that become in, a, in and of themselves platforms. So you have companies now building upon these APIs and that shift is akin you know, uh, from a paradigm shift between kind of on-prem computing and cloud computing. So it is, in our view, it is absolutely a fundamental shift in the industry where these APIs are platforms in and of themselves. They're very rich, they're very horizontal. And then the second part is they're very natural. You know, the, the, the interaction model is, you know, uh, brings down the barriers because, you know, you communicate with these models and you prompt them, you know, or you put in text. And the same way I am talking on this stage. You don't need a lot of syntax, you don't need a lot of expertise. And then the third, you know, in my opinion, why, they, why it is really uh, a, a shift and a change, they work and they work really well on unstructured data and use cases that have historically been in the domain of human, uh, you know, expertise and reasoning, you know, creativity, productivity, you know, reasoning over very large, you know, uh, data, you know, uh, patterns. Historically, we've used humans in that domain. So I do think, you know, when you look at these factors and building on what, you know, Andrew so well said, there, it is very, very uh, uh, real. Uh, there is hype, and we need to be very responsible, and we need to be very grounded that, you know, if you take out the hype, the use cases that emerge out of this are indeed very durable, and it is a, a paradigm shift in the industry. Okay. So uh, uh, Jensen made it very clear on Monday that he really wants this to continue. What's your take? <laughs> well, I, I think to build on something Ali said, you know, if you think of like the history of computers going all the way back, uh, originally computers speak ones and zeros, and so you had a very small number of expert humans who learned how to speak in ones and zeros. And then we created programming languages that are higher level like C and Java, and, and still you needed a lot of expertise, maybe not quite as much. And, and now we're entering this era where the computers are coming to where humans are, and, and, and computers can interact with us in ways that are natural to us. And so if you think about all the power of computation, you know, all of the things that we do that are digital all day long, if you, if you now make it so that any person on the planet can access all of that power without needing any of the expertise you needed in the early days, or even what you needed five years ago, I, I think this is gonna be completely transformative in how, I mean, frankly, how our society functions. You know, it's, it's gonna have uh, uh, impact in enterprise, it's gonna have impact in um, just the power you're putting in everybody's hands. And I think that's, that's going to be quite transparent. Uh, that, that's true with disruption. <clears throat> Absolutely, yeah. Okay, so let, let's, let's establish there is something here, and what I think many people in the room, and many others watching us <clears throat> remotely, are wondering is, where do I start? So narrow the time frame to the next year. What are the use cases you think we're going to start adopting and seeing, especially in, 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 the, in the enterprise? Maybe start with you again, Jonathan. Yeah, well, everybody has a tremendous amount of data. Um, enterprises have, this is what they do. They collect data, they filter data, they sort through their data. Um, a lot of it is structured, a, a whole lot more is unstructured. And I think that the real use case is to be able to take that data um, and turn it into automated systems that can make decisions or can recommend actions based on the patterns of, of um, you know, the way your business has functioned historically. Uh, I, I think there's so much value locked in this data, and especially in, um, in unstructured data that was never, that you know, we, we'd kind of log in an archive, but what do you do with it? Well, well, now you can take all that unstructured data and use it to customize a model, to build an AI that, that has access, um, instantaneous access to all of that information, that can formulate answers and responses and, and look for patterns, and I think, I think that's, that's accessible today um, and, and something that, that's very high value and, and very achievable. Other of you want to chime in on use cases? Yeah, let, let me share one story. So actually, literally right before we got onto stage, um, I was texting with uh, Renate Nyborg, who is the former CEO of Tinder and one of my collaborators. And so she and I have been, I've been working with her um, on AI applied to um, relationship coaching, right? kind of romantic relationship coaching. And this is an interesting case study because, you know, as an AI person, like, I don't know anything, I don't know anything about romantic relationships. And in fact, <laughs> if, if you don't believe me, ask my wife, she will confirm that I know nothing <laughs> about romance. Um, but I find that as an AI person, you know, partnering with Renate, who because she ran Tinder, knows way more about relationships than probably anyone I've met in my life, were able to come together and apply AI to a very interesting vertical. And I think so too it will be 
with your businesses. Um, I think a lot about you know, where the hockey puck is now and where it is going in the future. Where the puck is now and the topic of this is LMs and techs. And so this general purpose technology gives us the opportunity to find a lot of partners or internal partners to figure out the use cases. And then looking a little bit in the future where the hockey puck is going, I think what's happened in techs will happen in images and vision. And then there's a set of emerging use cases that, that you know, I'm developing and trying to provide support for as well. So first I'll take the Fifth Amendment on AI and romantic relations. Uh, but that said, I think you know, in the enterprise, I think you know, to what Andrew also said, these LLMs and these uh, you know, models work really, really well over unstructured data. And they're very horizontal in nature. And you know, the, the highest value use cases where uh, the ROI is very durable and is very high for a lot of the enterprises, I would say, first are bucketized in what these models do. They are really good in summarization. They're really good in content creation. They're really good in you know, understanding and, and generating text, code, images. And when you add those together, you know, and you can complement them with other AI services, you are now completely transforming customer service, one of the largest horizontal use cases, you know, uh, self-serve employee uh, in large organizations, uh, outbound customer contact centers. You're transforming manufacturing, the product life cycle that, you know, sometimes took, you know, uh, several years to build the product uh, can now be reduced to a few months because it's augmenting the productivity of that, you know, designer and that, manu and that engineer. Uh, it's also catalyzing the creative, you know, the media industry, you know, uh, content creation, you know, at scale. Uh, business process, uh, you know, optimization, uh, a lot of fraud detection in the financial services, a lot of very, very, very high value use cases that we are seeing right now in a lot of the enterprises, uh, you know, that uh, truly are delivering remarkable, uh, you know, <laughs> results. And I want to also say, you know, Christian, that it's very important to, to anchor that in that this is really an enabler technology, it's a tool. So, you know, when we look at it, you know, from a point of view, what can AI do? Yeah, of course, I do agree, and, you know, uh, Whitney's awesome, and, and in terms of it can improve relationships on the consumer side, it can improve business process optimization on the enterprise side, it can improve customer service, it can optimize manufacturing, uh, and there are a lot of different, you know, areas where, you know, it has to start with what is, first of all, the mission of that, enterprise, what is their business, what's their core business, what are the areas where there is the highest inefficiency, I would start with that, you know, for the CEO, what are the five things that keep them awake at night, and, you know, work back from that and say, is AI applicable for these inefficiencies, can I extract inefficiencies from business process, can I extract inefficiencies from customer service, can I extract it, you know, out of manufacturing, and so on and so forth. The second area, you know, I would say is really important is uh, employee productivity, like especially in this macro environment where, you know, there are constraints on, on talent, there are constraints on, you know, broader economic issues, a lot of our customers are looking for, you know, how do I use, you know, uh, generative AI and AI more broadly to increase the productivity uh, of my employees, whether it's a developer generating code, whether it's an analyst looking at different patterns of data, to, to Jonathan's point, you know, the ability to reason over data, especially with snowflakes like massive data platforms, that's unprecedented. And I think, you know, the other area I would say is employee morale. Believe it or not, like, you know, uh, I look at a lot of our customers and, you know, and especially the developers where there's a lot of grudgery that happens, you know, uh, you can take out a lot of that repetitive behavior and, uh, and, and part of the work and apply a lot. So there, it's a very rich topic. I would say it's going to be transformative and disruptive across a lot of industries, across a lot of different use cases. But you've got to start with, you know, what is core to your business? What are the areas that are, you know, the highest pain points? And therefore, then you can justify the economics because at the same time, these things are not cheap. But they're cheap when, you, when they are applied to a very high value use case. So I think for it's, this is true for many of you in the room. You say, I'm going to try this LLM type of technology. And the demos are up and running in a wow mode very quickly. Is that true? Usually, like, time to demo is very short. But then you start testing it in the real world. And maybe the results are not all the way there. There's considerations around safety. There's considerations around security. What, what advice would you have? What perspective do you have on how do we think about uh, safety, security, correctness of what this technology produces? I, I can say a few things there. So I, I think if you think about a, a, an enterprise, um, even within a single company, 
you don't necessarily allow every employee access to every piece of information, right? Most, most information is subject to some sort of information controls. And so if you're going to take data that you have you know, inside your company and use it to train an AI, um, you wouldn't necessarily want all of that data to be in one AI that any person can access and, and therefore indirectly get access to all the knowledge around your whole company. Like at NVIDIA, for example, you know, we have chip designs and a relatively small number of people have access to those chip designs. So if we wanted to train an AI model on those chip designs and have an expert chip designer, um, there, there's, there's a lot of isolation information controls we would need internally to, to support that. Um, and so I, I, I expect, I believe, that within single companies, you're going to have dozens, hundreds, thousands of custom AIs because you need these AIs to respect these information boundaries. Uh, and, and, and the platform that we've been building with Nemo is really about this idea of how do you support efficiently very large numbers of customized models. So you can start with your base model, but then you can add data and you can add it in a segmented way and keep track of you know, which data went into which custom model, um, serve all that uh, and do that securely. I, I think that's a, a really important aspect of, of this when you actually want to apply it to the enterprise. Yeah, it ties a little bit to something we, we mentioned many times at the conference, which is there is no AI strategy without data strategy, yeah. and data strategy includes governance and role-based access control, so you're saying yeah. that carries forward. It has to, to carry the through, exactly. Yeah, I, I don't think one giant model that you just train on with all of your data is, is actually um, even allowed in most, most organizations. Yeah. You guys want to add something? Yeah, you know, th there's a very interesting trend um, that, uh, of, of uh, letting AI get into more applications. It's been happening for a few years, and that generative AI is accelerating. So it turns out we've been talking about AI for a long time, but for a long time, what were the valuable AI applications? It was the, let's call it billion dollar applications, such as building a better web serving thing you know, for a company like uh, Google, or building a better web search, or building a better product recommendation system. So about 10, 15 years ago, you know, my friends and I, uh, various of us worked out a recipe for how to hire dozens or hundreds of engineers to build one piece of software to serve 100 million users because you're a big consumer internet company and that generates economic value that makes sense for that investment. But it turns out, once you go outside consumer software internet, hardly anyone has 100 million or a billion users to which you can apply one piece of software. And instead, I'm seeing projects like, um, actually, for example, my, my friend Dan Maloney is here. His team was driving a project where we're working with a pizza maker, taking pictures of pizza to make sure the cheese is evenly spread. That's like a $5 million project. Or <clears throat> I was doing some work with an agricultural company um, where in a farm, if the wheat's already grown, if you can use computer vision to figure out how tall is the wheat to chop it off at the right place, then you get more food out of the farm, so it's more money for the farmer and better for the environment, as another like $5 million project. And so one trend I've been seeing in AI is, instead of just working on these billion dollar projects, there are also tens of thousands of, let's call it $5 million projects. So how can we get those projects executed? Because the old recipe of hiring dozens of engineers, it doesn't work for $5 million project. I was even talking to an AI leader of one of the large clouds um, that said, hey, Andrew, I only have a few hundred machine learning engineers. How do I solve all these problems with only hundreds of machine learning engineers? And, and he couldn't. So some interesting trends in AI is, um, tools, including prompting your know, large language models, that is lowering the barrier to entry. Uh, the projects you used to take me like a year to build, you can now build in, you know, certainly to the demo phase, uh, in, in days maybe, uh, and with computer vision too, what we've been doing, projects that used to take me a year, we can now do in days. And this is causing a very interesting shift to the workflow of machine learning, where instead of resourcing, thinking things through, planning out like a massive budget exercise, we now have people say, you know what, I'm just gonna build a prototype, I'll do it over a weekend. And then if it doesn't work, I waste the weekend. But that pace of iteration and the workflow of machine learning is changing to much faster POC, and then you can find a safe way and responsible way to test it, to gradually deploy it. So I'm seeing very interesting changes in that workflow of machine learning. I could talk about that for hours. Yeah. Uh, Ali, your, your, your take. Yeah, I mean, I, I spend 99% of my time in the enterprise. And yeah, this is what you do for a living. <laughs> yeah, yes, and it's, it's the number one question, actually, even at the C-suite. And I would say there are three areas that, you know, when we speak to a lot of the largest customers in the world on, you know, how do you really adopt 
AI and what are the security considerations, what are the things you need to address. I think, you know, Jonathan and Andrew touched up a couple, on a couple of things, but I think, first of all, really understanding, you know, the importance of where you're applying these services on what kind of data and understanding, you know, what are the principles, uh, you know, that you have to have in the organization depending on what type of enterprise you are. For example, if you are a media company and if you're using generative AI to create creative content, you want to have a very transparent conversation with your client to say this content didn't just come from a human designer, it came from an augmented model with a human designer. You want to have principles around, you know, that level of transparency and that trust, but you also want to have a social contract with your employees that you're trying to increase and augment their productivity and you're trying to catalyze their creativity. And I think it has to start there, it has to start at the leadership level in understanding, you know, how you manage that relationship, how you manage that, co that content, how you manage that, uh, you know, a specific set of services inside the firewall, you know, of the enterprise. Because you are dealing with client data, you're dealing with your own data, and I think, you know, Jonathan touched upon a very important point. You know, if you are a CFO, you know, of Snowflake, you have material information for the market, and if you're in a chat conversation, that content should not be made available to somebody who does not have access to that material information. So how do you partition you know, the sessions within the prompt? How do you partition the data? How do you make sure that all that role-based access control is really in place and implemented within the architecture of the service? It's one thing to look at, you know, chat GPT and say, wow, what, what an amazing conversational bot it is on, on a website. It's a whole different thing to implement it inside the organization's yeah. uh, firewall and apply data rules and data governance and role-based role access control and how you apply. So you need to have really a very deep understanding of the roles of the service, of the use case, of how you manage the data. I think that's kind of baseline. The second is, you know, I kind of commingled with the first point, which is, you, you know, we have something in Microsoft called Responsible AI Standard, and that is really a, a governance process, uh, a set of tools uh, and processes, a set of, you know, best practices and transparency notes, and a set of, uh, you know, systems engineering level work that has to happen at the service level to ensure that these services are secure, uh, you know, at the code level, you know, in terms of the output, uh, in terms of, you know, the content moderation, in terms of, you know, the fairness, uh, the transparency, the, the privacy aspect of the data, all of these things are foundational. But we also pass on these best practices to customers and say, you know, do you have a team that is looking at this from the policy point of view? Not just the technical point of view. What is the shifting landscape of regulatory environment? What is the shifting landscape within your own organization? All of these are part of security, you know, discussions. The, the last part I would say, you know, in terms of that point is really have a conversation openly with your customers and with your employees, you know, uh, that are working on these technologies to make sure that as you implement them, as you roll them out, you are being prepared for what is to come. Because there are a lot of areas here that we are still, there are unknown unknowns as well in this process, and you want to have a mechanism to get ahead of the curve so that you're not surprised down the road. So again, the very, very deep question, we can, you know, spend a lot of time on it, but I would say these are the basic building blocks, and it has to start at the leadership level, that this is important and it has to be done in a very grounded way. Uh, how, how do things play out in terms of biases, alignment, safety, in, in, given the fact that the context matters? Like what, what may be acceptable in, in the United States may not be acceptable in a different country. Maybe one company has more tolerance for something else. So is it all about these APIs and tools for you to implement your, your policies? So I can, let me, build on that and then maybe Andrew or Jonathan. So yes, I think it's a fantastic question. So first, um, let me give the Microsoft point of view, and that is when we look at all of our services, uh, not just the generative AI services, we are looking at it you know, from a point of view of a governance around a set of core principles, as I mentioned earlier, you know, privacy and safety, inclusiveness of the model, fairness of the model, uh, transparency of the model, accountability of the model. All of these are core principles that guide the entire engineering process, the entire product development process, the entire go-to-market process. You know, uh, you know, fairness in, in computer vision models around skin tone is critical for medical you know, research. Fairness, you know, safety of models in computer vision in manufacturing environments. You know, they don't have to be generative AI, they can be the traditional AI services, but they need to be guided by a set of core principles 
uh, on one hand. The second is tooling. So we publish a lot of tools uh, to keep uh, the conversation going, and they're open source tools like FairLearn and InterpretML. We also have a responsible AI dashboard in Azure ML that allows you to understand the data uh, exploration, the features, the weights, all of that is available so you understand what's happening under the hood and you know, have an, a path to explainability of the model. And then the third, of course, is the policy-driven discussion on the gray areas that you know, need a human you know, conversation. That said, I think the last part I would say, you know, question to your question is, in generative AI, of course, because you know, the, the model weights are not necessarily in the, in the, let's say, in the commercial models, they're not available to the user, it's important to have the right test data, the right evaluation data set, and the right human audit to be able to ensure that the balance of any potential output of bias is countered you know, accordingly. And we work with a lot of customers to do these two kind of balancing acts. Okay. Yeah, yeah I can, maybe I can just say a little bit about what are the tools that you use to create uh, an AI, um, you know, how do you teach an AI values, which is, I think, fundamentally what we're talking about. So you start out with a base model that's trained on, you know, all sorts of text from all sorts of sources uh, that, that's going to represent a lot of different viewpoints. Then there's this step uh, called model alignment, and, and there's some famous algorithms like RLHF, known as RLHF, and there's others where you, you can st take this model and then train so for, it. For everyone, RLHF, yep. reinforcement learning. From human feedback, yeah. Um, and, and the idea there is you start with your model and you use humans, so you tell humans, okay, these are my values. Now you as a human rate the output of this model, and you, you use that signal to further train the model to, to align its values with the, this, um, usually a rubric that you give to your human raters. And then there's a the final step when you actually deploy the model, um, and there's different systems for this. We released something open source called Nemo Guardrails, where you, you actually want to now monitor what the AI is doing in real time um, and, and potentially intercept a bad response or place guardrails on a conversation. And I think you know, each, each of these stages, it's important to think about what are your values and, and what, are, what are the values to which you want to align this AI. It's, it's obviously the case that every organization is going to have different values. You know, if I'm creating a chatbot, if I'm a toy company creating a chatbot that lets a child chat with a character, that, that's going to have such a different set of answers to questions versus if I'm a government agency creating a, you know, something, a, a portal for citizens versus if I'm a financial analyst and I want to create something to help me with my analysis. You, know, you want these AIs to have kind of different personas and different values and, and you would guardrail them and you would align them in very different ways. And, and so all this, again, speaks to how important it is to, to build custom models, to have your own data, to, to be very thoughtful, as Ollie's saying, about what is the purpose, what are you trying to accomplish. Um, and, and I believe there's not going to be one, you know, one AI with one, uh, one set of values. There's going to be thousands or, or maybe probably millions of AIs with different values based on the use case and the organization and the, and the perspective and the task that it's trying to perform. Let, let me generalize it to model quality, and I'm going to go to you, Andrew, because... At the end of the day, these are different aspects of quality. And I don't know how all of you in the audience do it, but there is a new language model being published by someone and released <laughs> by someone on a daily basis and a weekly basis. So it's hard to know which one do I use. When I mentioned to Andrew I wanted to talk about quality, his initial response was like, oh, a gazillion years ago, I already did a talk and a training and a framework. But give us your perspective on all of this and, and model quality and, 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 and biases and alignment. Yeah, so I think. You know, when you think about the AI journey and how it relates to quality and evaluation, in the AI community right now, there's a lot of work and thinking on how to evaluate these things. Um, so I actually taught a, a, a course online with um, OpenAI uh, team, uh, OpenAI's Isa Fulford, on best practices on how to build applications using large language models. And a large part of what we taught is actually evaluation. I, I do see, I know Christian's seeing a lot of teams, short time to demo, but boy, even though the demo works well, how do you know it's safe to deploy? Or how do you know it's not safe to deploy? So I guess um, we talk a lot about it in some of our free online courses. Get your teams to look at that if you're interested. Um, but, but, but I also want to share just a little bit on the whole journey from start to deployment, right? So one of the reasons why the generative AI revolution is so exciting is um, 
a lot of value from AI so far has been on structured data. In fact, I suspect a common experience in this room, you know, a bunch of my teams, we put our data on Snowflake uh, and democratize access within our company. So we say, actually, I should give Dan Maloney, my friend who's in the audience, he actually made that happen. But we then say, hey, everyone, here's the data on Snowflake, have at it, you know, build a streamlit app, do analysis, whatever, and that let a lot of people do creative things and surface creative things that I would have never known about. So that was fantastic on our structured data. It turns out that the majority of the world's data, therefore your data, I think, is unstructured data, meaning text and images. So 80% or so, depending on who you trust, 80 plus percent of your data is probably unstructured data. And like a year ago, you guys started supporting unstructured 18 data. 18 months, yeah, yeah. 18 months, sorry, my bad. No, no, you're, you're, you're <laughs> in the right ballpark. <laughs> and so the, 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 the exciting opportunity that's ahead of all of us is you know, I saw, I've seen repeatedly when you stick your data on Snowflake and let people have at it, the creativity that that's enabled, I think there's going to be a major wave where you, you know, stick your unstructured data, text and images onto Snowflake or whatever, and then let your teams have at it. And also what I'm seeing for text and increasingly vision is the ability to develop something using prompting, it democratizes access. It lets, you know, low code style development Let's, your, let's, let's a smart engineer with a clever idea throw together a demo, throw up a stream that app, demo to executives. If there's an interest, then keep on investing. So that bottom of innovation for text and images with unstructured data, I think would be, would be a very exciting wave of innovation. I think most people still underestimate the magnitude of that transformation that's going to come. And then as it gets further along, then of course you need to evaluate it properly, especially if there's risk of harm or bias, and then do that before you deploy publicly. But there is a huge wave of transformation ahead of us, I think. Yep. There's a debate that we have constantly inside Snowflake on how all of this will play out in terms of how many models we have. You've been very clear, so I'm gonna start with you, Jonathan. But, but there's an interesting question as the Mega models, the, the, the open AIs, the cloud from Anthropic, uh, become useful for a broader set of use cases. Do we end up with five super models that do all sorts of things, or do you end up with what we call the, the million model hypothesis, where you're going to have lots of specialized models per customer, per use case, et cetera? You've made your case, so already have there. So, Jonathan, what, what's your take on yeah. how this plays out? I mean, I guess there's a range of specialized models. So I don't think there's going to be millions of models trained from scratch. That, that just doesn't make sense economically or, or, or for what you're trying to accomplish. So I do think we're, we're going to have a relatively small number of really big models trained from scratch. Um, as, I, as I've argued, I think there's a lot of reasons why you would, you would want to take then further domain-specific data or application-specific data and use that to fine-tune and customize your models. I think there's some debate whether that's something you can do purely at, at runtime um, with, with prompting and, and what's technically called in-context learning or few-shot learning, where you, you give a model a few examples and say, okay, now keep going. And or prompt windows are getting bigger. Yeah, exactly. Or, or if that's something that you, you actually want to train a model using a technique like uh, P-tuning, which is something you know, that we, we support. So I, I think that's still kind of an open debate. But I think there's no question there's a lot of opportunity to take your data and build custom models for your application. The one argument, I think, that really pushes it towards what I believe is the future, which is a, a large number of these fine-tuned models, it, it really is the data isolation. I don't know, if, if I train a model on a whole lot of data, I don't know how I guarantee at runtime the data doesn't leak to someone who's not supposed to have access to that data. And I, I, think, I think that's a, a pretty strong argument that's going to push towards lots of custom models fine-tuned on custom data that now is isolated, um, insulated from each other, and you can have access controls and governance policies. Ali, what's your take? How it plays out? I, I think uh, I'll build upon what Jonathan said. I think uh, frontier and premium models will continue. Uh, you know, Azure OpenAI GPT-4 is an example. I think these are very expensive, very complex engineering models that require the resources of very large companies and a concentrated set of you know, talent that can work on them and can harden them and secure and make them secure and compliant and, um, you know, and have the iterative feedback loop both within the enterprise but also within the broader ecosystem and the enterprises that can harden these models. And they will continue being very horizontal and rich and generic in nature. And uh, so I do think there will be a 
a few of these very, very large models, and they will continue, and they're going to be very relevant. I do think the market and the needs and the use cases, as Johnson said, there is rich enough for the proliferation of a lot of other models, you know, uh, both, you know, closed models, but also, um, you know, uh, fine-tuned custom models on private data sets within the enterprise, if you consider those to be models, those definitely count. But also, I think a lot of the variety of open source models emerging today, whether they are models around uh, a certain vertical industry or use case, whether they're around a very specialized domain or language, whether they're around, uh, you, know, um, you know, certain economic parameters, to Johnson's point, that, you know, a closed model may not, you know, meet the criteria. I think, the, I think we're going to see both, and I think, and from, you know, we support both, indeed. I think our point of view is pretty clear that frontier premium models are, um, are where the value is, and the value is being created for the right you know, scenarios, but there's a lot of complementarity that will continue to evolve in the ecosystem. Uh, and that's a good, healthy thing, because it helps balance a lot of the different um, you know, uh, gaps in terms of where these models may not do a really good job, but also fosters a really good innovation debate on how we you know, continue to learn and improve uh, as we go uh, forward in the giant of AI journey. Yep. Yeah. Andrew, your take? No, yeah, it'll be both. I think. Um, the large models like OpenAI's, yeah, Anthropic, Google Palm, lets you prompt it, build something quite quickly. But I'm seeing more and more companies, or more and more businesses increasingly use that, get going quickly. But then to get mm. eke out that extra performance, sometimes you have to fine tune your own custom model, not train from scratch, as Jonathan pointed out, but take an existing large model and then tune this to your own data. And I, th I see that as actually increasing trend. So I think it'll be both. So, so we're getting close to the end. I have two, two more questions or topics. One, one is, mm -hmm. for, for the audience here, which many of us are trying to figure out, how do I go about Gen AI LLM? What would be one piece of advice? What would you say, learn this, try this? What, what, what would be the advice you would give to someone to be able to make more progress or make progress on leveraging this amazing technology? Who wants to start? Sure. So maybe two, two things. One, um, invest in education. You know, there are, I don't know, my team's released a bunch of free courses on prompt engineering for developers. Uh, yesterday, we launched a course on Coursera uh, with AWS on generative AI that goes deep into technical things. So you yourself at the executive level or certainly get your engineers to go learn about this. And then second is um, let people try things. I've seen more companies fail by starting too big than fail by starting too small. In fact, I think that um, it, it'll be a you let your engineers experiment, even if the first few projects are not massive successes, the learnings from the first few projects, let them add up to bigger and bigger successes over time. And, and we need to do a training with Azure as well, right? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I, so, I, yeah, so I would say uh, take Andrew's courses for sure, but uh, here's what I would say, Christian, it's a great question. I mean, if I look at just myself, and I have two teenage boys as well who ask the same question, like my oldest is a geek, he wants to study computer science, it's like, do we still need computer scientists? Do we still need deep developers? I'm like, absolutely, you know? And the, the thing I would say is like, when I studied, you know, uh, in, in college, we, you know, AI was expert systems, rule-based systems, none of the stuff we have today existed. And I always joke and tell my kids, you know, if I applied what I learned back in college, I would be unemployed today. And that is a fact. I think lifelong learning, to Andrew's point, is fundamental. And I think, you know, one of the biggest sectors that are yet to be disrupted is going to be education uh, with generative AI. I, so that's, I say, I say, you have to invest in yourself. You know, Warren Buffett always says, create value, you know, by learning, because that is the area that is going to increase your value in the market. Uh, you know, in the span of seven months, you know, my life has gone from, you know, zero to 100 on every conversation like we're having today on generative AI that has not happened, you know, back in, right before Christmas, right? So when you look at, you know, this, the pace of change, Embrace a growth mindset, I would say. Embrace the change. Do not, like my, my, my wife sits on the board of our kid's school, and I went and did a talk to the school, and they said, what do we do about chat GPT? I said, embrace it, because the kids are going to use it whether you like it or not. And if you don't embrace it, you're, you're putting these kids at a disadvantage, including my kids, and they need to learn the new tools of the modern era. So have the courage to embrace these technologies. Have the courage to experiment with them on your weekend, at night. Have the courage to go and learn, take on courses, take, you know, watch videos, attend talks, read books, start at the, you know, you don't have to go and become a Python programmer. Like, you know, you can learn a lot of the basics just by understanding kind of the bigger uh, picture. So I would say definitely at the individual level, that's the key thing I would recommend, you know, and also 
don't feel guilty that you're falling behind. We fall behind and we're in the core of the service and the tech. It is that fast of a moving journey. And the worst thing you could do is like, I talk to executives and they themselves are struggling. It's like, Ali, how do I keep up? It's like, you don't have to keep up. You have to understand the foundational elements. You have to develop a point of view and a thesis and a strategy for your organization. And you have to build upon that. And you have to be very focused. Focus is going to be very critical. If you're going to try to go and learn everything, there's no way you're going to be as deep as Andrew or as deep as Jonathan in the research of these things. And you don't need to be. You know, what is required for your job, that would be the focus. That's great. Jonathan, your advice. <laughs> yeah. I think LLMs and, and these modern AI systems, you know, they, they democratize access to this technology. And, and what's nice about that is, is now you have people who aren't technical or have not thought of themselves as technical who could start a project um, and actually build something of value that's reusable, that's repeatable, that takes their expertise and packages it up in a way that other people can use. But you can also take this and put it in the hands of a data scientist and, and give them Streamlit and have them build something incredible way more efficiently and, and solving problems um, you know, in, in analyzing data and slicing and dicing and, and doing things interactively that they never could have done before. So, so I, really, I really see this technology as something that takes everyone, whatever level they're at, and, and can make them more productive and, and capable of building more powerful tools more quickly. And, and, and I agree with what both of them said, which is you know, focus and start small. Just pick a project, pick something you do every day, and see if you can automate it, see if you can make it more efficient. OK. I have a last question for each of you. Mm -hmm. Think of one year from now, Snowflake Summit one year from now. I want one prediction from each of you on the state of generative AI, the impact of generative AI. One year from now, I have only 12,000 witnesses that are going to hold you to your predictions. So who wants to start? Yeah. No pressure. I feel like, I, feel like I, want to go, I want to go first, because I don't want them to use my prediction, and then I have to predict Go for it. Go for it. <laughs> I, I think we're, we're right on the cusp of the rise of multimodality. I think there's been a lot of excitement about these text-only models, and they are exciting. And, and I think text is fundamental to a lot of things. But images, I actually think audio, which no one's mentioned yet, but I think models that can understand text, audio, tabular data, which is obviously critically important to so much of what we do. Um, I think we're right on the verge of models that, can, that have facility in analysis and synthesis of all these different data types. And I expect a year from now, um, we're all going to be talking about the multimodal capabilities of these models, where you can throw a chart at it and ask it to explain the chart and ask it to look at this chart and predict, you know, what's my sales forecast going to be next year just from an image. I, I think all this is going to be possible within the next year. It's going to be transformative and incredibly powerful. That's great. Multimodality. Let me jump in. Uh, my my prediction is going to be a subset of yours, but there's one piece I want to focus on, which, which, which is images. I'm glad you said that, because now I feel like I'm less out on the limb. <laughs> so what's happened in uh, text is, is really the trend was large pre-trained transformers, right? That's the, that's the technology. So in 2017, you know, my old team, Google Brain, published the text transformer paper. And since then, there was a wave of innovation, scaling up these models, GPT-2, GPT-4, Turing model, and so on and so on, until Instruct GPT, and then we got Chat GPT, Bard, you know, Bing Edge Search, and so on. Um, in 2020, three years after the Vision Transformer paper, same team, Google Brain, sorry, in 2020, three years after the Text Transformer paper, Google Brain published the Vision Transformer paper. And I was just at CVPR last week, the large computer vision conference, and I gave a keynote at one of the workshops and so on. But within the computer vision community, there's a lot of buzz and excitement about vision transformers in a very similar way to how the NLP text processing community internally, two years ago, everyone knew something was up about text transformers before it burst onto the widespread awareness through ChatGPT. So what I'm seeing is the trend is very large models trained, pre-trained on a lot of internet scale data. With that, with a little bit of additional data, just a text prompt or you know, a visual prompt is something my team's been working on. With a little bit of additional data, it allows you to build a very powerful AI capability. So we've already seen this transformation in text. And if you go look at all the research and innovation and so on in computer vision, I think these innovations are coming as well to, to, to computer vision. Um, and this is exciting because 
most of the world's data is unstructured data, and in fact, most of the world's unstructured data is actually image and um, video data. So I think that revolution will enable a lot more of you to then you know, start to process your video and your image data as well. So. Great. I would, Ali, you have a final word. I, uh, so I would agree with the multimodality. I would say, uh, if I can get two predictions, I think the first <laughs> is we're going to make tremendous progress on the explainability of these models and the level of assurance that society will have that they are indeed accretive to creating value both for the economy, for the enterprise, but also for the individual. So my prediction is each one of you here next year will have one way or another an AI assistant helping you do your job and we will see how that plays out. You know, when these things come together between multimodality and the safety and the explainability, I think uh, the mainstreaming and the, and, and the pervasiveness of, of these models are going to, or these services are going to increase. That's amazing. So we're at the end of our time slot. I, I want to say thank you so very much for coming here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Louder. Give me the you. loudest of all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank, you. You. thank, you. thank you, Andrew. Sorry. Thank you so thank much. You. Andrew, please. Thank you. And by, by the way, we just got some late breaking news. We have some, inter some interesting news to share with you. Please roll a video. And now, for some breaking news. It's snowing in San Francisco. Yes, you heard me right. We have received some videos from viewers across the city, and it is happening, folks. Our own Elsa Mayer is at the Golden Gate Bridge. Elsa, what's the scoop? Well, wait, it's true. Snow is falling. What makes this more bizarre is, as you can see, it's a beautiful sunny day today. Not to mention, it hasn't snowed here since 1976. Let's check in with meteorologist Howard Leo. Howard, what's going on here? I have no idea. Thank you, Howard. Oh, uh, hang on. I just received word that San Francisco Mayor London Breed is about to give a press conference in City Hall. Let's go to that. I am happy to announce that Snowflake Summit, the world's largest data, apps, and AI conference is coming home to San Francisco. So mark your calendars because Snowflake Summit will be at Moscone Center the week of June 3rd, 2024. We can't wait to host this amazing event and all of you, the brightest minds in technology, building the future and pushing the boundaries of what's possible. Get ready for snow in San Francisco. See you next year. Well, that solves that mystery. Have a great day, folks. I'm going snowboarding. Is it cool that we're going to San Francisco? Thank you so much to all of you for being here, Snowflake Summer, with us today. We still have a great day of content today, but look forward to seeing you all. Thank you so very much. Happy Snowflake Summit.